thank you, sorry. Which will be hosted by the Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities at the University of Fort Hare. I would like to acknowledge today, first and foremost, representatives of the Jabavu family who will be joining us via the link. I would like to acknowledge the Vice-Chancellor. I would like to acknowledge the Dean of Law. I would like to acknowledge the Speaker, Professor Wachella, and the respondents, Dr. Zal and Dr. Ulrich. I would like to acknowledge members of the faculty and students. I would also like to acknowledge outside visitors, like Ms. Buzi Madikizela, whom I hope to persuade to become a member of Fort Hare. So I'm delighted to have outside visitors. Now, these lectures are going to take place quarterly, and they really are, we hope, going to be the flagship of the faculty's seminar series. And the conveners are myself and Dr. Valerie Farim from politics and Dr. Tando Nomkia from social work. And the lectures have been very generously supported by the university's Department of Institutional Advancement. I must emphasize that this is not the only seminar series in the faculty, but these lectures do send out an important signal that in this faculty we value seminar and workshop and lecture initiatives. And we hope that they flourish across departments, Dr. April, Dr. Compi, for instance. Um, we hope that they flourish across departments and research and interest groups. Let a thousand flowers bloom, although the historian in me makes me promise that, that the thousand flowers will not be followed by any type of crackdown. The lectures are named in honor of Noni Jabavu, who is an underrecognized but major South African and African literary figure. Mr. Bavu comes from a famous Eastern Cape and Fort Hare lineage. And Mr. Jabavu tells me that she was born right here on the Fort campus in 1919. Mr. Bavu was an acute observer of life at Fort Hare and in the Eastern Cape. And she was a brilliant writer. And she's known best for her two books, The Olka People and Drawn in Color. And I really do hope that some of Ms. Jabavu's capacity to incisively observe and analyze and describe infuses this series of lectures and the discussions which follow from them. And this moves me on to the next point. I must thank our most honored guests today, um, the Jabavu family, represented by Mr. Siabunga Jabavu. I thank the family for allowing us to name the lectures for Noni Jabavu. And I promise that we will do all that we can to live up to the intellectual legacies which she left. And I thank them for being with us today, albeit on the link. I would have, have really liked them to be with us in person, but um, we all know how constrained and complicated university budgets are. And following this opening, Mr. Siabunga Jabavu will address us for a little while. As Dean, my aim is to nurture and cultivate intellectual cultures in the faculty, and particularly the elements that are distinctive to the social sciences and the humanities at Fort Hare. Intellectual cultures, I must add, are not something just for those in the realms of the professoriate. Everyone in the faculty needs to share in these, professors, other academic staff, students, all of them should be able to access and understand and have, an under and have a say in intellectual cultures as they are manifest in what we research, what we teach, and importantly, how we teach it. The University of Fort Hare, as we know, is committed to a decade of renewal. And the question for us in the faculty is how we can 
revitalize and rethink our intellectual cultures. In fact, what we do in ways that are unique to the faculty and which contribute to the university's drive for a decade of renewal. The Nani Jabavu lectures are concerned with this in mind, not to do something new, to rehash what we've done, but to open new territory. That's what we want to do. We want to be brave and bold and step where people didn't have not stepped previously, much like Nani Jabavu did. And the idea of the black humanities, as you know, has gained considerable purchase in universities over the last decade or so. And it kind of coincides with and has become intertwined with the movement for decolonization in this country and elsewhere. And this is a very attractive notion, this idea of the black humanities, to help us think about what we do in the social sciences and humanities. But, and there's an important but there, despite the, the traction which the idea of the black humanities has gained, I, worried, I worry that it's the ideas which accumulate around it can sometimes become a little bit cliched, a little bit too formulaic, a little bit too simplistic, perhaps a little fey. And moreover, they don't necessarily lay out our notion of distinctiveness, what we do at the University of Fort Hare. And certainly, we don't want to do the same kind of black humanities that might be done at the University of Western Cape, at Witz, at the University of Ibadan, or at Berkeley. Those places have got more money than we have. They've got more resources. And it means that they're probably going to end up doing a better job than us. And once again, where would our mark of distinction be? So I think that what I'm saying is that we mustn't just try and copy, mimic what happens at other universities even if the directions which they are taking are progressive and innovative and exciting. We can do better than that. We have to do better than that. Nani Jabava would have demanded that we do better than that. So, to be sure, broader currents in the black humanities matter to what we do. But I would like these lectures, the Nani Jabavu lectures and the discussions which they prompt, to concentrate on how social sciences and the humanities which are rooted in the history, in the culture, in the languages, in the location of Fort Hare, um, offer some insight into the shape of these subjects, these disciplines at Fort Hare. Put differently, a composite of, 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 the, of, these, a composite of these fields of knowledge must be rooted in who we are and where we are. The Eastern Cape remains effectively South Africa's colony with resources and especially people drawn out from the Eastern Cape to other parts of the country in a grim recap of migrant tales which mark South African history, anthropology and literature. And Fort Hare must be part of how the country itself decolonizes. And to be part of that healing, we must undertake imaginative intellectual work. That's our purpose as a university. And from the coordinates which I've described earlier, geographic, historical, cultural, linguistic, and institutional, we must ask what new knowledge, what new methodologies, what new questions, what new angles of investigation can emerge? These are questions that will, I hope, be raised in the non Jabavu lectures. And they are questions which the faculty must take on. Now, as we go on, each lecture will have two respondents. One commenting on the issues that the lecture raises for teaching, our curriculum, our pedagogies, how and what we assess. And the other commenting on its significance for research. In this way, I hope that the lectures help to set our, to set our intellectual horizons. I'm taking an expansive and brave and bold strokes that perhaps Noni Jabavu could have identified with as a human, as a writer. But more particularly, I hope that they stimulate discussion in the faculty room. about distinctive innovation and excellence in terms of both our teaching and our research. What are the social sciences and humanities is at Fort Hare? What are they known for? We should be able to answer this. Is there a particular style that an outsider would say, 
ah, there's a forte person. I hope that we could be able to, to, to approximate that, to answer that. And my longer term ambition is that out of these lectures, out of the innovation, out of the energy that exists in the faculty, out of fostering ties with members of the black intelligentsia, especially the younger, younger black intellectuals, we can begin to imagine a four-tier laboratory for the social sciences and humanities, where we can experiment with new types of knowledge, where we can host residencies from scholars and writers and artists and other intellectuals whose work resonates with us, where we can host short-term fellowships for members of the Fortier community to think, to develop, and write not only their research work, but also to reflect on their teaching and develop their pedagogies, write new curricula. In short, I would like to see an intellectual hub that represents the intellectual heart of what we do in the social sciences and humanities, and which belongs to us all. This ambition is obviously longer term. Pipe dreaming, I hear people say, but I hope not. Um, and I think an idea such as that is fundable if we do the hard work in the run-up to that. We have the energy in the faculty. We have the gravitas of history. And I hope that these lectures can add some momentum. We have some absolutely marvelous young scholars, and I'm purposely only going to mention those who don't yet have PhDs. We have Siseko Kamalo doing work on language and existentialism. We, we have Kanyan Glovel doing work on the impacts of gang violence. We have Burial Fissa doing work on franchise, class formation, and comparative history. We have Anella Glodlo doing work on marginalized men and the idea of a new lumpen proletariat. I'm waiting for him to speak back to Fanon. So we've got the capital, we've got the energy, we need to marshal that. And today we also have a number of outside visitors who've joined on that thing. Um, and I'm delighted that they're here. We want more such people. Because to fulfill its historical mission, Forte must become an alternate home for black scholars who are interested in the versions of the humanities which we express here, however we attach this. Um, and to do these things, um, I reiterate that we, need to, that, we need to, that we need to be offering ideas and courses that, that are distinctive and exciting. And I invite you from inside of Fort Hare and others from outside to come and help us, to help us to build, to use the language that the Vice Chancellor uses. This is a building project. There's a university one and we've got a faculty one. Um, and I, I want our faculty to be not a last option for people, but a first choice to come and study and think and work here. But again, we have to offer an intellectual culture and programs that are exciting and distinctive and relevant and edgy and different and touch on the resources that we have here. Let's try and imagine what this looks like in these lectures. And in closing, as we go forward, what might our faculty motif be? How can we identify one that aligns with the university's declaration of a decade of renewal, yet is specific to our faculty? Perhaps these lectures will help us answer that question. In any instance, I hope that the series gives our intellectual community, our staff, our students, those considering coming here, the confidence to ex experiment with ideas and the insurance that their knowledge matters. Um, with that, I would like to hand over to Mr. Jabavu. Uh, thank you, Professor Ross. Good uh, afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Vice Chancellor Professor Mutungu and the rest of the staff, the lectures of Forte, various guests that are here, 
the student nayewonke umuntu okoyo good afternoon colleagues i hope that you can all hear me i am siabonga chabavu the grand daughter of this giant we are from the sixth generation of the chabavus now when Neil Rose talk about this uh, uh, memorial lecture to recognize Noni Chabavu in terms of her work. We were very delighted, really, because it 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 brought memories. You know the history of Kwano College it was the Chabavus starting from John Tengo Chabavu. his son professor davidson don tengo jabab as well as noni those are the nucleus of the formation of the university of forte way back uh, you know from 1915 up to its establishment in 1916 under the stewardship of john knox bokwe who was a great family friend of John Tengo Chabab the original members of the board governing council of Forte 1916 fast forward colleagues uh, dr alexander k the first principal of forte in 1916 might be delighted that today uh, uh, umar chili is been recognized uh it's very interesting historically because no ni chabavu unontando ikamalake she is a second daughter of davidson don tengo chabavu and florence tandi swama kiwane who is mrs chabavu mary ttt eh uh, no ni was born there kwano college in 1919 on the 25th of august she was born there at, at the university because they were staying there you know whilst they had a house a anthropite so of course what it used to go up and down so when we recognize her work you know in her birth place which is forte it's become to us as a family uh, uh, something that we are very proud of and then it was saying the person who came up with this idea of recognizing and honoring noni indeed a siapulela sila family now uh, when you talk of kwano college and no ne pese the great giants of the east and the early african intellectuals you talk of the jabavus you talk of the sogas you talk of the bokwes you talk of the makiwanes now those are the pioneers you know you know the mishapelim the khubusanas and many other families the tunyiswas those are the persons that revolutionized the thinking of black nationalism in the eastern cape particularly to south africa as a whole now noni is coming from that type of families in south africa of course later on the the matthews the jordans you know right up to the mandelas the tambos the sisulus now when we talk of the legends of the prophets of the eastern cape you talk about those families that were in the forefront of the early struggle of the black people now unoni and of course we all know she left the country at a very young age as a 13 year old daughter because noni's grandfather john tengo jabavu who was the founder of info zabantsundu and the influence that he had over his sons alexander makole Richard Rose in his you know he wanted them to be the symbol of hope for the people of the eastern cape as well as the people of the country hence unoni 
started in London, you know. Of course, she started at Lovedale as a young kid, as a young kid, grade one, grade two, grade three. Then at, when she was 13, then, you know, she was taken abroad to study further in London. That's where she was prominent in terms of she rose as a great pioneer journalist, the writer, you know, during those years, including the, the freedom fighter when it comes to women issues in Europe, where she made history, she was appointed the first black female editor in 1960 in London, you know, as well as representing South Africa in the United Nations to fight women issues in the 60s. So I'm saying, we are talking about of, of a really of, 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 of a giant, you know, who is coming from a rural area of Alice military her home. You know, uh, 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 colleagues, this morning, one of our family friends, um, Mrs. Moti, said, you Lisa Boku, an 85-year-old granddaughter of John Knox Boku. He sent me a message. You know, I want to read this message to all of you. She just said to Mamu Yolisa Boku, I wish I could attend the lecture on Sis Noni, as we called her, a dignified and well learned daughter of Professor Davidson Don Tengo Jababu, we also should not forget his sister Ulexi and brother Obutengo Jababu. Our families, Professor Jababu and Dr. Bokwe, which is Rosemary, she is the eldest daughter of Dr. Bokwe. They were very great friends with Professor Jababu, you know, who helped to shape Middle Drift and develop a very close knit village. She then said, thank you for reviving our memories of Tracy, Yolisa Motis. So I'm saying, uh, she's a senior of, 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 of the Bokwe family. She's 85 years old. As you all know, you know, this year we are also celebrating the centenary of John Knox Bokwe, who was the best friend of John Tengo Jabab, the founder of Ivo Zabansundu, who also worked with him there. So I'm saying, colleagues, we, we, we are delighted, really, as a family to recognize Umamunu Nimi Sedenziake. And of course, uh, 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 you know, you will dwell more. You know, when, when, when she's, she spent most of her life in exile, she didn't want to come back from Zimbabwe. You know, uh, uh, I remember uh, uh, the late Reverend Arnold Stofile and my father and, and some journalists you know, they wanted to fetch her, you know, during the dark days of her day to say, no, only come back home. She didn't want to come back home. But she thought that South Africa is still, you know, that old uh, apartheid system. But uh, it, later on, uh, she came back. You know, we have to make sure that she come back. We were helped by Virginia Perry, who was the author in Zimbabwe. You know, was was very old, you know, and then some Tata guess she came, you know, what she said to us. She wants us to make sure that her legacy it's not being lost. Then she said to my younger brother, look, I want you to carry on writing about my life. And then she said, we need to protect her work as a family. We must register what you called a Noni Chabavu Foundation, which will protect her legacy. So that the children of the Eastern Cape that wants to study journalism, literature, or whatsoever, that foundation can able to help those kids from the Eastern Cape. That's the legacy that she wants to leave behind. And then therefore, she even said, it would be great if University of Forte, where she was born, where her father, DDT, was a teacher there for many years, including her grandfather was a pioneer of SMA Forte, can that be put together, making sure that Forte 
with the Nuni Shabab Foundation, they are working together, making sure that her dream is being realized. You know, she said, you know, in the deathbed, those words, colleagues, that was in 2008. And then she closed her eyes. Some tatake, you know, we buried her on top of her, her mom. You know, it is a pie answer. So, so, colleagues, the 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 two grandsons, Tango and Ben, they are in London. Now, they wanted to join us, but because of the time zones, uh, and Utengo, of course, is at work. Is you know, because we, we said we're gonna record this so that he can able also to have share in it. He sort of said, we, I must pass a message to greet you, all of you. That's the, the first born, you know, of Usis Tembi, Noni's daughter, Utengo. He is in London, and his younger brother, Ben, is in London. Then in Uganda, Sislexi, uh, uh, which is Noni's sister, she died. There's also another Tengo there in Uganda. So I'm saying, you know, our family, is in London, Uganda, and here in South Africa, in Port Elizabeth, and East London. Now, we, we are the spokesperson of the family here in South Africa, because other brothers of us are in London. So I'm saying we, we, we are really humbled and honored as the Jabal family, so that Uno College, as it used to be called, this university in 1916, right up to 1920s, it was called Kwano College, I College Katabavu, because of Ujili, who was the first black lecturer at that university in 1916. Him and Dr. Alexander K, they started that university, you see? So we are really proud, you see, to have today that Unoni, which is daughter of Didi is being recognized. Her memories are going to be recognized and be remembered throughout the year. So in closing, colleagues, the Noni Chabapu Foundation is going to be launched a uh, uh, Vice Chancellor uh, and Professor Neil Rose in September in 20, 28th, which is on Wednesday. Unoni, by the time she came back in the 70s, she was she was a free, free she was a freelance editor for for Dell Dispatch. She was working with David Donald was there between 1976 and 1977. Now now Dell Dispatch with us, you know, both there was a series of 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 of, of uh, what you call it articles that he used to write. It was called the Noni on Wednesdays. So we are going to be launching that foundation on Wednesday. You know, with the dispatch, we want to do part of to, to you guys, you must form part of us and the family to make sure that indeed her legacy is being organized, you know, so that we don't just stop this, including her books that she wrote. We're going to republish them so that the profits that are going to be made by the books, by all the work, it goes towards the foundation so that we can have the bursary that will be given in honor of Noni for the children that want to study literature and journalism, according to her wish. Uh, program director, in those two years, I really, you know, no, no, feel honored, you know, on behalf of the child family. They are all here. They are listening. We've got uh, 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 my sisters, they are here. The mother is here. All of us, they are all, they are all here. So I'm the, I'm the one chosen to, to speak on behalf of the family. Diabule la kakulu. Thank you very much, colleagues. Thank you. Mr. Jabavu, thank you for, for, for being here and thank you for your family being with us. Um, you remind us of the massive legacy that we want to be part of. Um, and I think you build bridges between the the, the, the remarkable intellectual life which flourished around Fort Hare and what we want to be, where we want to be, every single one of us in this room, and we thank you for that. Um, I speak for myself.
perhaps I speak for others as well, you've infused me with a sense of earnestness of our task. The bar is high here. We've got hard work to do. But there's some very, very smart and diligent and creative people around here. We can do this with that kind of inspiration. We must strive to the, to the, to the model which Nani Jabavu sets for us. Um, her, of that whole cluster of major intellectuals in the Eastern Cape, I hope that we are able to, to work with, to ally, to and collaborate with the Nani Jabavu Foundation. Um, but overall, I think you've given our faculty a rousing call to action and I'd like to thank you and with that hand over to today's speaker, Professor Luvuyo Wachella from NAHEX. Professor Wachella. Good afternoon to everyone. Um, let me just first uh, subscribe humble to the protocols of this uh, event. But having said that, I would like to first appreciate that we have got uh, the Vice Chancellor here and some members of um, uh, the faculties and special mention, of course, has got to go to the Jabavu family who have graced us with the occasion. Perhaps before I start, what I need to say, what I'm going to speak about today um, is a paper that I largely published with the Southern Journal for Contemporary History about 18 months ago. Uh, Prof. Neil Roos actually coaxed me to, <laughs> to publish that material. Um, what you're seeing as an abstract in front of you, slightly misleading in the sense that it's too contemporary, looking from 1960 going to 2015. However, in the conversations we've had with Professor Neil Roos, he urged me to go a little bit back so that I can reflect on the legacy of the Jabavus in this institution from the foundation and going forward. So that what you've got in your abstract is going to come at least after another 10 minutes of this prelude which I'm going to give. So I start in this way really uh, because we have got these fresh challenges, crucial fresh questions um, about historical studies and humanities, as well as we, as we are re-examining the potency of aligned academic departments in this tireless work, especially under this global COVID-19 pandemic. But long before that COVID era, academic units already depicted this testing university ambience. Um, many were and are inundated by ever escalating teaching and administrative loads, uh, albeit often with makeshift staffing. Uh, funding, of course, has been for a while governed by the imperatives of financial austerity, delimiting what deemed viable and not so viable academic departments and threshold of teaching and swift research, out research outputs they mainly appraise this. And under such settings, there is hesitancy to invest much on either emergent scholars or drawn out research that often resonates with historical studies and generally humanities. And oddly, euphoria often related with what is defined fourth industrial revolution. Don't ask me what this term means is not devoid of humanity, even if it duly slants capital to scientific and mainly digital initiatives. Truly, 
The shaping of each university's historical studies or humanities, they tend to blend unique and comparable facets. Invariable, they are raised over long term and often aligned to dynamic scholarship. Importantly, the genesis of the study of humanities and history is often traceable within the first three decades of foundation of Forte in 1916. And the institution itself is a microcosm study of facets of African intellectualism and nationalism at several levels. In fact, speakers today have already reflected on that. In the earlier stages, up to 1923, while still referred to the South African Native College, the institution ran limited academic programs. Uh, students could study for school matriculation, agricultural and business diplomas. The first degree program sanctioned by the University of South Africa, or UNISA, which led to the first generation of prominent graduates, Z.K. Matthews and Edin Nwane in 1924, was that of Bachelor of Arts. And the very first academic staff of the college, Davidson Don Tango Jabavo, affectionately known as DDT, the father of Nontando Noni Jabavo, whom this seminar series tributes, taught all these early students. Um, her grandfather, of course, has already been mentioned, Tango Jabavo, was much of the late 19th to early 20th century key figure in the Cape African politics and circles of the Methodist Church as the first editor of the then widely circulated African newspaper, Imvo Zabanzundu. He, together with Isaiah Budimbele and Charlotte Makeke, were the stoutest African representation in the original founders of the college. The point usually is very painful to emphasize, but I have got to go through it. There were hardly women amongst the initial 20 students who registered in 1916. That embodied patriarchal, early post-colonial, already segregating South African society. Albeit the college also bred a multi-ethnical community. In fact, by early 1920s, the college council already admitted colored and Indian students. Gertrude Ntlabati, who enrolled to study metric in 1918, a year before Noni Jabavu was born, started a teacher's diploma after passing metric in 1918. And thus became the first female African graduate of the college in 1928. Um, her period coincided with that of Jane Gould and her sister Zobeda from the Cape Muslim family who started business. Klabati's graduation influenced yet another generation of women such as Pumla Ngozwana and Phyllis Ndantala who while studying at the college in the early 1930s inspired a young Noni Jabavu. That was before her parents sent her to England in 1933 where they hoped she would in time study and train to be a medical doctor but in the end she did not we will catch up with her later. Meanwhile, parallel that fledging dynamic multi-ethnic social setting, the college had also mapped up its academic route. Following the 1923 Higher Education Act, it became an institution for higher education with twin functions of secondary schooling and university education. <clears throat> That legislation and large academic staff enacted board of faculties of Senate, leading to six main arenas of academic development, and most of those had historical dimensions, even though they did not include historical studies. I need to emphasize this, because historical studies is only going to emerge in 1938, but I'll get to that. The first embrace, they first embraced education these academic developments as the college sustained the opulent practice of teaching training for the Union in South Africa that consolidated what the 19th century mission schools already started. Secondly, the college offered a course in agriculture which was touchy subject 
at the time, since following the 1913 Land Act, Union government saw need for ecological reclamation and intervention as token strategy to sustain African reserve land and Forte being in what was designated reserve was supposed to act critically on that. And thirdly, the college offered courses in science, especially on physics and chemistry, as a part of pre-medical course. The fourth of the created courses consolidated existing commercial forecasts, leading to business diplomas, even though with less historical forecasts. And the fifth entailed religious and later theological studies and was, however, similar to humanities with grounding in history. The last and the sixth course with closest impression to historical studies or that resonated with such discipline included Bachelor of Arts or Humanities degree. This also comprised sub-courses in law and history of African administration. At that time, students in the field of humanities and law still followed teaching or law professions, and the expanding union government administrative cogs also absorbed many. Thus, other students also ventured onto specialized practices as officials who served mainly in departments of justice and the infamous Native Affairs Department. Now, we need to emphasize, while segregation policy infiltrated many facets of the 1930s when these programs are really shaping up, the reach of the college remained not geographically confined to Union South Africa. Indeed, the period from the mid-1930s to the 50s became heydays of the college in its recruitment scope from the continent. In spite of the emergence of Makerere in the 1920s, Fortier became main institution in what was still colonial southern, central, and eastern Africa to offer higher education for Africans. Even so, this is the very, very critical point, especially now that we're talking the language of decoloniality. One cannot underestimate upshots of colonialism and the unequal, unequal depth of body of knowledge the system yielded. The colonially driven African survey, for instance, in 1938, premised on interests about the so-called Africa problems during that decade, hastened the evolution of African studies in several academic institutions. Africa became the living laboratory, hatchling several disciplines, aimed at broad dimensional understanding of not only formation of its communities, but also its linguistic lineages and patterns. This all became crucial for broadening humanities. At Forte and elsewhere, African studies, which included ethnic history of Africa, combined with social anthropology and African languages, emerged by 1938 to become one of the main attractions of what was the BA degree then. Just to go a little bit back on Jabav DDT particularly, he had actually radicalized African interest earlier when he garnered formation of an all-African convention in 1935 to protest against removal of long-threatened Cape African franchise and inbound draconian Herzog land bills, already skeptical and in fact vehemently opposed to segregation at that time, he had already written a widely circulated paper on segregation fallacy in 1928, a system which he believed was due to fail. Uh, his AAC, or All African Congress, as it's uh, as famously known, crystallized his views, and throughout the 1930s and 1940s, it incubated a more robust unity movement that attracted younger students here at Forte we enlivened politics. Some of these, like A.C. Jordan and Wycliffe Sotsi, were in African studies. Uh, and they took part in communities, histories, and even in rural struggles, and began to write quite extensively on histories of their respective communities. Uh, 
He unfortunately lost his wife, uh, Florence uh, Tandiso Makiwane, whom uh, Mr. Jabavu just mentioned, the mother of Noni, a few years after retiring in 1944. And in his mourning phase, interestingly, uh, he embarked on this very informative trip to East Africa and India that has yielded one of the most published travelogues to date. In fact, Vets University Press has just published it just recently. We had to do an endorsement uh, about uh, 12, uh, 16 months ago. It's widely circulated. One of DDT Jabav's former students, of course, after his retirement, as I've already mentioned him, Z.K. Matthews headed the African Studies. And following um, this period then, Matthews received great support from Monica Wilson, um, who lectured social anthropology at Forte during 1944 to 1946, whilst also conducting field and ethnographical research in this area. In that same period, Matthews and Wilson's desires were for African studies to focus on research, accruing and possessing knowledge. Nevertheless, that was slightly in conflict with Forte, which at that time still had priorities of teaching to research uh, because they wanted to produce these graduate students. Critically, that generated African studies focus was also missing to a history department, which after its creation from 1938, fell under the headship of Hugh Chapman, a war officer who merely drove a syllabus slanted towards classical and modern European history. Um, Chapman had a very short term. It was uh, followed by Donovan Williams, uh, from 1952 to 1959. At the time, the college also fell under the wing of Rhodes University. Um, but it, what's important, under Donovan Williams, then the history department drew historical studies into the writings of the early liberals, featuring the decks of Leonard Thompson and Monica Wilson uh, on South Africa. Some of you may have read that sort of Oxford history of South Africa, which has always been regurgitated in most universities, would be familiar with this. Much of that included earlier writings, of course, on conquest, missionaries' works, and transformation of African communities, as well as aspects of early African nationalism uh, and relevance of history at that time of the early 1950s at Forte, also aligned to the politics that were steered by national party governments' racial discrimination legislation. The multiracial nature of teaching staff and more so multi-ethnic composition of Forte student body during the 1950s decried the ever-expanding national party government policy. And importantly, both the ANC and unity movement used the college at the very same time as a recruitment ground for younger generation political activities. There's so much documented on this. They actually targeted Forte. This is where they were drawing in this younger, younger generation activities. Even though students gradually displayed enthusiasm in history and African studies, there remained institutional challenges. Engagements against looming racial discrimination policy also meant the Senate often contended uh, with political actions as the takeover of campus by the National Party government loomed in 1959. When it finally came in the middle of that year, it also unfortunately hastened the death of DDT Jabav, whose health was already fragile. The takeover would ultimately have major ramifications for the university college as it would eventually have for what became new ethnic black institutions of higher learning country wide. So I'm actually now going to start to what you have in circulation. Having given you that backdrop, but I'm going to squash this, but I just wanted you to have this because it's a rich legacy of the institution carrying forward. Uh, we, we always argue as history, historians, there's always an introduction to an introduction. So. <laughs> So, so here, this section, I am following 
And I've put a title deliberately considered humanities and emergent historical studies and condensed 1960 to 1990. And the way to start, I just want to emphasize, it's easy to fall in the trap of writing on, on history of segregated and ethicized higher education in South Africa when writing on post-1955, sorry, 1959 Fort Hare, largely because the National Party government's endeavor to control and ethnically divide Bantu education. Crucially, the rich historical basis of Forte leading to 1959 confirms this is we need to underline. This, is in, this institution was not necessarily a historical black university. Rather, the National Party government's control from 1960 merely tainted it with such status. Um, so the infamous 1959 extension of the University Act, as we all know, created these four ethnic colleges, Durban, Westville, Western Cape, Ngoya, and Teflop. But for Forte, a special 1959 Transfer Act to ratify the handover of the college to the reins of the National Party government. Not surprisingly, the act also clarified overall intentions of the National Party government to channel Forte for closer speaking within its ethnic university strategy, a, a strategy on a long-term governance. Amongst many facets, the overriding control of Africana management had on New Fort Hay. I'm saying New Fort Hay, this is the post-1959, uh, that was now under the government appointed uh, rectors for the first time from 1960 onwards, were increase of African-speaking white staff and their control of academic programs, and helped, of course, by massive resignations and dismissal of those who protested earlier against the takeover. Uh, that racial shift of those employed became startling. Just to give you a figure, black lecturing staff dropped from 45% before 1960 to under 20% during the mid-1960s. In essence, there was only one African or black academic head from 23 departments of five faculties, arts, science, law, commerce, and education by 1965. And black academic heads increased to only two after 1966, after Forte's Golden Jubilee. By then there were seven faculties, uh, the five I've mentioned, um, and with the elevation of divinity and agriculture to faculty statuses. At the core of the Africana staff domination of Forte's academic program was their duteous control of politically orientated humanities, which is, which is the crux of this uh, sort of presentation, where 13 of the 14 departments fell in their leadership. Only one of the 14 departments in that faculty remained staffed with blacks, and it was Bantu languages, retitled from African languages which hitherto was part of African studies. Uh, clearly, Forte being planned as a closer ethnic university had to parallel government policy and adopt Bantu languages to engender views of separate cultures. Unsurprisingly, the restored African studies program towed the National Party government line, encapsulating essential disciplines of anthropology and archeology span it also offered a course on Bantu administration. The latter ensured broad introduction to the study of African affairs, African affairs concomitant to South African population configurations and administration, literally teaching on the blueprints of, of apartheid really. Added to that program was curatorship of African collections, presented haughtily, I would say haughtily, in, in a sort of condescending way, while similarly, similarly depicting duty to preserve the material culture of the Bandu. All of these revamp programs betrayed earlier purposes of Didi Jabavu, who within his first 12 years at Forte, of course, bemoaned the segregation fallacy. Uh, further afield, his daughter Noni who by 1960 had become notable writer instead of medical doctor, was aware of tribulations faced by fellow Africans under increasing apartheid. Um, the, the book uh, which uh, 
Prof. Neil Roos mentioned, um, drawn in color. He narrated African contrasts in that of African protectorates and apartheid South Africa, which came out in that book in 1960, also told the tragedy that befell the spirit of liberalism at Forte. Her criticism was not overly emotional, uh, given that African studies at the institution largely emerged with her father. Indeed, condemnation also came within Forte itself. Um, one can Ndamsa, in fact, we're trying to trace the family of Ndamsa, uh, who was once in the African studies uh, 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 as a student in the 1940s, then became senior academic, trained abroad, and attached to the department, lost his job in 1965 for making candid remarks, uh, uh, got fired almost immediately. One of the quotes he put, now the white men control the education affairs of Africans, when he was referring to the African studies at Forte at that time. And in fact, he, his story is so uh, emotional because he was asked to mount his own appeal to the minister of Bantu Education, uh, Mare, and everyone knew it was going to be a lost case anyway. Uh, and he lost and was summarily dismissed for making this seminar somewhere and using that terminology. Historical studies, which had been shored up by Donovan Williams up to 1959, took a different route from 1960 to 1990. Initially placed from 1960 under a Stellenbosch trained Colin Coutier, it took predilection towards European history. In his first 20 years, he adjusted scope of graduate program encompassing classical history in lieu of the existence of a separate but linked department of classical or Greek studies. Thus, his European history syllabi started from the era of medieval Europe to the immediate aftermath of World War II. Uh, by contrast, continental African focus remained narrow and only on snippets of early European infiltration and coastal and especially southern African riches ranging from foci of Portuguese contacts with African groups in the region. And that syllabi similarly looked at the Dutch and the British marine epochs as well as there are processes of conquest, including these polygonal roles of agencies and philanthropies like traders and missionaries. Uh, that Southern African study culminated with a divisive position of South Africa within Commonwealth at third year level, essentially a current theme at the time. Uh, whilst endorsed reading decks for well over two decades, right up to the 1980s, uh, really, uh, on aspects of European history, uh, which offered longitudinal uh, study of that continent. All these texts were general, and his department relied mainly on the early liberal historians on South African themes as well, even by the mid-1980s. And this was in spite of Marx's focus on South African economy and society in that period, having expanded historical scholarship in many facets which even saw the emergence of the social history movement. I remember my first chat with the VC at UCT. That was the school. He mentioned almost Im immediately that, so so that social history, the lacks of finance learning and others, um, when we were just talking about scholarship. And this fought her in the midst in the 1980s, absolutely not existing, not even known which was really, really sad. While such debates were not even realized by Kutzier's department, there remained concerted efforts, of course, to align syllabi to some of the mythical assumption of what was a depopulated South African interior. So more themes were added on population migration of the Southern Bantu and in accord with apartheid history. There were focuses on contrast between Bantu and Khoisan, there were also emphasis in, and on aspects of histories of either the trans sky or the cis sky. Um, as much as some aspects of that history syllabi were deplored by some graduate students, and ironically, even after Forte became autonomous 
from UNISA after 1970. It remained unchanged, as I've indicated. It was even worse at honors level, where it stayed aligned to that of Rhodes History Department. At that level, focus was on optional papers carrying themes on struggles of parliamentary sovereignty in England during 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, and there were options on American Revolution, focus on influences of British imperialism, comparative study of constitutions of Canada, Australia, and then there would be tiny bit on South Africa, no African history whatsoever. Uh, for students at these levels, lessons inside lecture rooms throughout 70s and 80s echoed these lingering traces of epochs of profound European domination. They stared this persistent culture that created illusionary sense of intrinsic supremacy of European-derived values and peoples. And some felt Africa was largely presented as European history or candidly experiences of Europeans in Africa. And it took, interestingly, a personal investment of 23 years for, for Kutsier under three government appointed rectors to build a history department with a complementary staff of five persons to render teaching um, for, for Forte. That was equally changing, of course, by mid 1980s. His successors, uh, they, they, you read a little bit about them, Detmond Moore and Ocamp, they contended with the university's shifting social geography now as academic departments offered lectures to newly opened branches within the Siskai. Having expanded immensely within the Alice campus during the same period, but being inappropriately located within the homeland, Forte was equally confronted by complex sets of politics. The peculiarity of the Siskai administration was evidenced, uh, of course, by its non-financial contribution to the running affairs of the university, which were still being eked by the South African government's Department of Education and Training. Uh, it aptly reflected Didi Jabav's 1928 inference on segregation fallacy, which as he practiced would not work. Whilst his daughter, Noni, worked as weekly columnist of the Daily Dispatch during this very same period, she echoed similar sentiments on even more pronounced racial system of the National Party government uh, and, and, of course, apartheid. Ironically, under that fallacy, Forte had embarked on a mandate of serving Siskai homeland, but the National Party government was crudely grasping the price of sustaining such homeland system. It was, however, forces that had built around mobilizing, of course, student politics and unionizing Forte workers for much of the second half of the decade of the 1980s that posed fresh challenge to the university administration during the early 1990s. And I'm going to move as I'm going to the last section and looking at the optimisms of change, the challenges history department amidst this democratizing and expanding forte. Of course, the collapse of the Africana administration uh, was not without challenges and it emulated that of the Siskai and South Africa's trans transition in the 90s, an epoch during which prospects of humanities and his historical studies bordered on optimism. The switch from the Africana dominated administration of John Lambrecht preceded violent national negotiation processes towards political change and development of post apartheid constitution uh, negotiation process, whilst Forte operated under an ephemeral caretaker, had collapsed. Many of you, you know this, into a forum of diverse political parties. Uh, uh, known as CODESA. Uh, I don't need to, to bring you into that history. Uh, as the homeland policy was collapsing, amazingly, fortunes of Forte with student numbers continued prospering as demands for higher education from the black community swelled in the early 1990s. And moreover, the university opened its doors to returning exiles whose majority related to this institution because of its long connection with the history of liberation struggle in the country. To crystallize that image, Forte had inaugurated the ANC aligned uh, Sibusi Sobengu, a professor of political studies, as the first African 
vice chancellor in 1991, thus ending um, any of this lingering trace of what was the Africana administration. And Bengu's leadership role was also given vast support when the ANC struggled veteran and fought her alumnus uh, of the late 1930s uh, and early 40s, Oliver Tambo was appointed chancellor. Uh, in his acceptance speech, Tambo, everyone knows this, invoked history, observing that Forte had, quote, since its birth been a site of epic battles between forces of democracy and those opposed to it. It was clear that the ANC committed to supporting Forte, which it fittingly saw as a recruitment ground for future generations of activities and its remobilization campaign. Of course, the ANC was in supporting for it only. It looked also at the other tertiary, tertiary institutions as recruitment grounds. I remember I was at Rhodes University during this time, so many trips, Chris Harney, who, who I had even the pleasure of riding a car with him, uh, as, uh, directing to where student affairs were. Uh, Steve Chouette and others, almost every week, they were holding talks in these institutions, wanting the younger generation drawn into the liberation movement, sort of. Um, so one major incident, which is so critical for us, uh, for historical studies at Forte, of course, was the decision taken by the various liberation movements in Johannesburg during 1991 to deposit their respective records at this university in recognition of its long association with the struggle history uh, the ANC at the forefront of that decision led the way and sent its first consignment of records to Forte during September 1992. In his receipt of the university, the Ch Vice Chancellor Bengu laid down the gauntlet to the institutions associated with the teaching and writing of the country's history. There is the quote there. This is the opportunity we have all been waiting for and there will never be a better chance for us to relook at our country's bitter past whilst we will be at the same time armed with the prospects of rewriting and correcting the account of such past. It is the moment to appreciate those who are in the position of teaching the history of the country. The deposit, of course, of these records by the ANC and other organizations, uh, uh, they nudge the history department to react with the purpose of including its syllabi, some of the key aspects that were foreseen to be appropriate for South African liberation history. And key challenges, however, still lingered as the arriving political parties' uh, consignments remained uncatalogued to be effectively utilized for proper scholarly referencing. And it remained so for well over another decade, uh, uh, being processed at the Howard Pym Library uh, initially, especially the ANC consignment and others had to be processed. And some, they're actually still being processed even now. Uh, I know I, under the VCs coming now, the move is digitization, which of course is still part of preservation and resorting this, this material. On the teaching front, the history department remained short staff and as it lost some of the teaching staff that was of course, gathered initially under Kutsia. Um, uh, and what's interesting, African studies, which continued the theme on African ethnic history since prior 1960, was disbanded at the end of 1993. Anthropology and archaeology stood as independent departments. I can see uh, Dr. Komanis is there. You were part of that department, isn't it? Um, from 1994, and swung few students who had continental interest to undertake history. As a result, overall, graduate numbers for history department remain steady in spite of being under-resourced department staff-wise. I need to emphasize here, just specifically, a little case here, the advent of what was the Gavin Baker Research Resource Center. That's not the GMRDC first, at Forte from 1995. Also widened dimension for historical studies. And under the leadership of a valued historian at the time, Sean Morrow, who followed closely material created earlier by alumni in African Studies Collection, this center developed research capacity 
for humanities and social sciences, and thus encourage interdisciplinary research with students based in different fields. Some students who had majored in history uh, and struggled with postgraduate supervision, they moved to this center. Uh, several were prepared to generously assist in the sorting of inbound donated liberation archives, and they gained face high and insight on context for benefit of their research interests. Others were engrossed by the rich records of Forte itself, in other words, the records of Forte, and the other focus area were on aspects of social history and local art. Um, and those diverse interests resulted in regular seminars, several dissertations and papers ranging from topics of indigenous art in the Eastern Cape to records of Fort Hare to activities of liberation movement in exile, um, such as the PAC, the ANC in Tanzania. And they even wrote a book on Somafko, the Solomon Matlangu Freedom College. Uh, unfortunately, the history department that could have profited from collaborating with this center or GMRC at that time continued with rendering its syllabi in isolation. Uh, that dog in the manger attitude to cross disciplinary scholarly work cost it an opportunity to augment its postgraduate program and thus remain strictly teaching rather than research aspiring department. Forte, like other tertiary institutions, had in this period uh, its own financial woes, of course, in this 1990s. And some of these relate or related to higher intake of students from very poor families, poor background, who couldn't meet tertiary education fees. Of course, Mandela's government, through its RDP, catered for what was called TEFSA. That's the uh, pre predecessor to NSFAS, uh, I think was called Tertiary Educational Financial Students Assistance. Um, uh, this didn't alleviate the problem and the financial instability. Uh, tested Bengu's uh, successor, especially uh, Professor Mbulelom Zamani, who now had inherited all this financial kind of uh, challenges. Um, but what is so intriguing, Professor Mzamani, however, opened further prospects for history and to a large extent curatorship. He centralized holdings for all heritage and liberation records, including the old collection that was part of African studies to a new National Heritage and Cultural Studies Center, NAHEX. If you didn't know, NAHEX actually is the creation of Professor Mzamani, and was opened in 1997. And moreover, he recruited staff uh, for history in a bid for the collection's material to be incorporated in a revised syllabi. Sadly, of course, his administration collapsed amidst these kind of financial ch challenges and consented staff and workers' protests. In the revamp then of Forte under Derek Swartz, uh, there was this caution on financial uh, challenges uh, and, and of course the revival strategic plan 2000 which was essentially or largely corporate governance tool it facilitated rationalization and realignment of faculties and I'm heading towards the conclusion now. <laughs> it also created and revamped centers for specific services and outputs um, as well as reset austerity on financial control under that scheme, that earlier center, GMRRC, was modified to govern make a research and development center, GMRDC, which you have got today, with a wider remit to drive and govern university research across faculties. New dean of research post with managerial staff was attached to that. Uh, Moro, uh, we had hitherto driven intense postgraduate research couldn't be retained, unfortunately, and was lost to Forte. Some of the history staff Zamane had recruited earlier uh, joined the new deanship that was called the African and Democracy Studies. If you read the, the, the sort of calendars of, of Forte in the early 2000s, there was this faculty called African Democracy Studies, which effectively coalesced three faculties, really, and these were arts, uh, where the history department, of course, was the one I'm focusing on. 
And then law, which was the largest staff but had its administrative glitches at the time. And lastly, there was theology that Mzamane had attempted to expunge uh, during 1998. Uh, and these were largely to save funds and positions of previous three deans and support staff were reduced to one. Um, so it has to be underlined that plan, that 2000 plan, did invest more money on strategic plan than on core scholarship programs and its end goals, that were exquisite, were not easy to realize. And importantly, uh, SWAT's administration also used the plan in managing the integration of the East London Roads campus that Forte inherited in 2004. And that was part of university's measures conceived uh, um, and applied by then Minister of Education, Kadal Asmal, who succeeded uh, Bengu. Forte's inheritance of roads, East London campus, he also raised these key questions as how the university was to deal with new identity of multi-campus model as the social geography of Forte continued to change immensely and no longer concentrated in Arles. Clear thinking was essential for the moving of academic programs across the divides of spatial campuses. And to partially solve the problem the new Bishop division was remolded to focus on programs related to public administration and governance to harmonize with the locality of civil servants in that administration area. You've got the next slide now. The pressure was taken off humanities disciplines to duplicate, of course, as I've in, in, indicated in Bishop, but the precise location of departments of social sciences and humanities between Alice and East London for Forte became even a bigger challenge. And the previous Rhodes East London division, just a background, backdrop there, it had started in the 70s mainly for commercial courses, but by 1990s, gradually integrated education, social sciences and humanities. And its merger with Forte amplified enormous overlap or duplication of academic fields across different spaces. As a result, the lifespan of that uh, faculty, which was African Democra uh, Democracy Studies, came to a hasty end at the start of 2005 with the addition of social sciences um, and humanities from the former Rhodes East London Division. That integration yielded uh, the faculty of social sciences and humanities we have today for both East London and Alice campuses. And that new faculty still included theology, but law, which hitherto was covered in, in, in the uh, African and Democracy Studies, moved to set up its separate faculty. So these lingering problems about limited staff of departmental levels and they related to teaching pressure, they continued throughout, even with, in spite of, the, of these sort of uh, real elements. Um, the point now I just want to highlight uh, is, uh, in fact, all the requisite configurations, uh, they, they didn't instantly enhance graduate history teaching and production, and even for other humanities, either in Alice, whose staff continued to be in short supply, or in the replica departments in East London that were by 2005 up to 2008, yet to have their own staff allocations. And fittingly for Fort Hare's legacy, Noni Jabavu, this is just about this time in 2005, was finally recognized in her country of, his, of her birth as she was bestowed with South African Literary Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, and, and there were equally encouraging developments, of course, at the University of France from 2009, a year following, unfortunately, Noni's death. She died in 2008. Um, the faculty received the National Research Foundation Sarchi Chair on Social Change that was uh, and is still led by Prof. Minkley. And this augmented postgraduate research for the faculty from 2010. Uh, also, Pfizer, that was originally one of the centers inherited from Rhodes, prepared for offer of two years master's degree in African studies. That dedicated interdisciplinary research and postgraduate training combined coursework and dissertation leading to qualifications to a master's degree in social sciences. 
The program was different from the earlier undergraduate 40 African studies that orbited around anthropology and archaeology, as well as African ethnic history and administration. And importantly, the new Masters on African Studies was likewise viewed by former history student as a vehicle for branching out to practical oriented career paths than a mere practice of history itself. Two more minutes. In spite of those advances, a 2010 review of academic departments across faculties led by then Forte Office of the Academic Affairs Deputy Vice Chancellor Rob Midgley was damning on the history department as it was for majority of humanities in the, in the faculty. Uh, you've got a next slide at uh, number 23. Uh, the, the, the report stressed that history had to invent ways of increasing student numbers and also address the declining continuity uh, of those majoring in the discipline and yes, especially critical for our list numbers where undergraduate enrollments had declined significantly and it was categorical that the existing model for history was not feasible and has for suggested possible solutions. And one of those, interestingly, was potential union of history with NAHACs. And likewise, afflicted departments uh, such as music, fine art, um, African languages to establish a school for cultural and heritage studies. And such option, uh, the report underlined, would ensure active utilization of archives held at the center, which would offer prospect for application of a chair in liberation studies. And another related possible solution the, re the review offered um, was the development of teaching and research niche around an Eastern Cape history heritage studies and in, in, in the archives. And that respect, it was an em emphasized that history should also work closely with the Department of Library and Information Science. And additionally, to these suggested options, <clears throat> there were generic highlighted challenges, like the non-equivalent access to pertinent resources, such as library holdings, which were common for several departments operating across campuses. The lack of community engagement, for instance, and strategies associated which uh, aligned with the university policy were also emphasized to be lacking. Um, so by 2015, the year which my presentation ends, the history department had gradually addressed some of these key concerns from the review. And this centered around revision of curricula, especially increase of undergraduate numbers which became visible, especially after 2018. Uh, there are equally efforts to expand, of course, numbers and something. But conversely, persistent problems of understaffing and massive administrative obligations still persist. Uh, and on another front, NAHEX, which has recommended or was recommended at various levels for collaboration in the revival of several humanities disciplines, faces its own challenges. Uh, initially premised on robust vision of curatorship and archiving, it has spent the last several years on long-term strategic mission of digitizing its holdings. Uh, and with very minimal staff, it has also embarked on, on other aspects too, uh, uh, to preserve university records. And these are outside sometimes of its ambits, but it concurrently has to contend uh, on, on dealing with other institutional matters too, that warrants a, a revisit and re-strategizing its vision too. Uh, all of these fresh challenges certainly warrant a very comprehensive thinking. And uh, while those talks are waiting, we all need to be mindful that all generated bequests and associated collections in the earlier years of Chabavu and their contemporaries, as well as those we have come in in recent times, this last slide, with newer records, are not merely end gains. These are not the end of it. They have to be drawn into fresh debates that will, in the long run, also provide scholarly identity for the university. That is the spirit, the Jabavu legacy, and certainly that which known is true for 
Thank you, I'm going to stop there. Thank you very, very much, Professor Orcella, for a masterful overview of intellectual and institutional history. Um, these histories, I think, are quite essential for us to begin thinking of the kinds of knowledge that are possible and desirable, and indeed the kind of scholar we wish to see emerging from this, this milieu and populating the social sciences and humanities at this university. So I think that that talk is a really fitting and good way to start the Noni Jabavu lectures. And I'd like to thank you very much for that. Just a pause, um, because I'm going to boast for a second. The Noni Jabavu lecture series is, is one major initiative of the faculty. Another one, which we're going to launch very soon, is a postgraduate hub, um, where we're going to be running seminars, we're going to be doing training, we're going to be bringing postgrads together so that they sit and they argue about topics from different disciplines and not so isolated. Um, and we're also going to have conversations about supervision and graduate pedagogy. And this is what deans do. I asked two people to do it, and I asked them to do it without any budget. Um, as it is, we found some budget for them. But the two people who are going to be running that are Dr. Cindy Zau and Dr. Nicole Ulrich. Um, and I've asked them if they would be the respondents to today's, today's talk. Um, as we said, one is going to comment on, on teaching aspects, that is Dr. Zhao, and one on what, the, what, the, what the, the talk meant for how we think about research. So, and that's going to be Dr. Ulrich. Now, I'm not sure who's going to go first, but I'll leave it to you. Um, either Dr. Ulrich or Dr. Zhu, please step up and then... Um, hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon to the, to the VC. Good afternoon to the deans, the Jobavu family, to my colleagues, and also a special hello to, I hope, our honor students online. This is about creating new generations. Um, thank you very much uh, for your fantastic paper and your presentation, Prof. Um, I think that you just remind us how interesting Forte's history is as an institution that reflects our apartheid and colonial past, but also at the same time represents a significant contestation of that past and a rupture with that past. So thank you very much. Um, I've been asked to comment very specifically on sort of the research implications of this paper. First, obviously, um, in spite of this, the damage done by apartheid and the homeland system, uh, Fort Hare is linked, and in, I think in just about everybody's mind, to the liberation movement and to African emancipatory thought. But I wonder, how do we write about the history of past liberation movements? And I, I, I think that's quite widely. Um, political parties, uh, feminist movements, trade unions. How do we write about those pasts today? and that celebrates the achievements of people like the Jabavu family and recognizes the bravery of many of our activists, but at the same time recognizes the very real disappointments of our democratic present. And Prof, I wonder if you don't really give us a starting point for that. Um, you historically grounded, and as a historian I'm biased, but you take our history, our terrible history seriously. But I think that you're also engaging with our present in a very critical and rigorous manner, but still very optimistic for the future. So I think that's a really good starting point for us if we're going to think about how to write about liberation from Fort Hare. I was also very struck about how important your study is in terms of making the history of this place of Fort Hare and the Eastern Cape visible. Because the more time I spend here, the more I realize how invisible we really are in national conversations and in international conversations. And that's quite a pity because I think, as you show, 
the very unique and different experiences of teaching and learning here at Forte has allowed you to ask very different type of questions. And the one, of course, that you highlighted and I think is very interesting is this questioning of Forte as a historically black university. And I think that's really something very important, specifically if you're looking at the field developing now around university studies. Where, where, I mean, how do we perceive historically black universities and why do we still have this division today? So, the fourth um, really important point, and I think it's related to that, is as we draw on our very distinctive experiences of Forte and the Eastern Cape, and we can actually make really important and significant um, contributions, that we mustn't just focus on our uniqueness. We must not be parochial. We must not use our uniqueness as a way not to have broader conversations, insert ourselves in national debate, and I think we're going to have to be quite robust about that, and insert ourselves in global African debates and also global studies more generally. So I think we must not be parochial, and here is, is definitely scope for comparative analysis and studies. And then finally, and I'm not going to dwell on this because um, my colleague will be speaking in a lot more depth about this. In this globalized and increasing neoliberal world, and you did discuss about the austerity measures and, and some of the problems that come with that, and the pressure of high rankings and of being more like other universities, that Forte must be more like other universities, how do we actually define and maintain a specifically African, a specifically Eastern Cape, a specifically Fort Hare identity? As we move forward, what values do we want to keep and maintain? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to recognize the presence of uh, the Vice Chancellor, uh, my Dean, the other Deans. I want to recognize the Jabavu family. It's an honor. Uh, and my colleagues from the faculty and um, the department and other faculties and outside visitors. Thank you so much. I've been introduced. My name is Cindy. Um, from the Department of English. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Prof. Wachela, for a perceptive lecture that interrogates uh, the critical subject of our history in an extremely engaging manner. Thank you so much. In my response, I acknowledge that the university is a colonized space. Universities are colonized spaces. And it's something that we cannot run away from. So while classrooms are sites of struggle and rapture, they are also laden with opportunities for reclamation. You can think of transformation, renewal. There's so much opportunity in the classroom. Therefore, when I was listening to Prof. Wachella speak, I see that we are called upon to reflect on what it means to be an African university, to be distinct, like what my colleague was just saying. We are forced to delve deeper into questions of identity, questions of belonging. Who are we? So from the vantage point of a challenging yet very rich history, we are nudged to take stock of our present and to forge new pathways, perhaps, into the future. Using our mandate, particularly that of pedagogy, teaching and learning as instruments in this regard. 
So my response to, to you, Prof, is predicated on the notion that Fort Hare's history should not only visibly influence one discipline, but rather its influence should be woven into the curriculum throughout all fields, all disciplines within the universities, across faculties. Because I feel that historical memory should be the organic thread that reverberates in our curriculum, throughout our curriculum, linking and keeping teaching and learning flourishing. Because there is no way we can separate and say, uh, history only influences this section, but throughout the faculties, throughout the, all the courses that we teach. The history of Fort Hare makes it a practical site of decoloniality, which is why I, I titled my, my response as harnessing you know, the potential that we get from history so that when we teach, we are trying to get ourselves into a space where the decolonial turn happens, where we focus on the indigenous, where we say we want to be globally relevant, but we want to be extremely locally sensitive to our local contextual situation. In teaching, in the humanities specifically, when we look at pedagogy, we see that our teaching methodologies could actually be aligned with where Forte is coming from, the rich history that has been discussed extensively here. Where does Forte hope to be in the future? So our history has to inform the alignment of our courses the future, where we want to be in the future, should also have a bearing. By definition, the University of Forte should capture the true essence of African identity. We have seen the contestations, we were listening to everything that happened from its inception to date. Forte's role predominantly involves confronting an atrocious history and building robust futures through pedagogy, research, and community engagement. So my take is that as a university, Fort Hare should endeavor to capture that distinctiveness. And by that distinctiveness and Africanness, I'm talking about uh, asking ourselves important questions, perhaps to say, what sets us apart as a university? What is unique to us? What is distinctive about our pedagogy? What is it that we can say, we do not compromise on this? What are those principles, those constructs that we totally refuse to compromise on? What are those principles that underpin our teaching methodologies? Those principles that are in defense of our history those principles that are shaped by African innovation, African sensibility, African philosophical orientation, if you like, where we are saying African knowledge systems and African ways of knowing, African ways of being are central. What are those principles? What are those constructs? And we weave them into our teaching. We weave them into our learning. So the Investor Forte is unique in its possession of uh, the inherent treasure of a rich history that is granted. But with a rich history comes the danger of basking in past glory and failing to harness the opportunities proffered by that history for the benefit of the student population and our society. So while Forte exists in the face of triadic forces of modernity, Eurocentrism, and uh, the coloniality of power, there is still that potential for Forte to tap into the history 
that rich, that contested history, tap into it and weave it into the curriculum so that our teaching and our learning can become distinctive. The higher education space is under siege and there are too many expectations to fit the mold, like what Dr. Ulrich was saying that, you know, the global rankings and all that. So the question therefore is how does Fortier execute its functions while remaining a distinctively African university which is unashamed of its past, but rather using it as a resource and as a springboard and drawing from that past to enhance pedagogical practices. So there are inevitable contestations that are woven, obviously, into the lifeblood of institutions such as Forte. But an important point to note is that having a rich history has tremendous implications and we have to be very active, proactive in tapping into that possibility. Having artifacts and images and referencing historical figures and legends is of tremendous importance to our institutional memory, to national historical memory. But we need to take cognizance of the fact that years of subjugation and imperialism cannot be unseated by us just referencing that past, that beautiful past. Yes, there are footprints, but we need to take initiative. We need to innovate. We need to take action in pedagogical spaces, in our methodologies. So there's a critical need to think more, Prof, about what the implications of this rich history are on how we teach, how our students learn, we have a rich archive. What are we doing about that archive? Are we using it in the classroom? Are we using it across the curriculum, across faculties? Pedagogical practice is directly linked to knowledge creation and dissemination, and obviously to graduate outcomes. So it should be known that as history is informing our pedagogy, and it's informing our practices. In the process of our delivery of that mandate, we are actually creating history. We are actually making history. So what history now are we making? We look at ourselves now and we look at our curriculum, how far we've come and where we want to go. We look at our present. What history are we making? So the nagging yet important question would be, how can we revolutionize our teaching practices right now so that, our, so that our students and our society can benefit? So after honoring our historical giants, such as Jababu, the next transformational step would be to open conversations and encourage discourses that empower blackness. It is not just about more black bodies, but rather more black minds minds that appreciate the manifestations of the coloniality of power and marginality in the 21st century, minds that appreciate the black condition and Ghana discourses that empower previously marginalized groups. So the history of Forte can be deployed in pedagogy to disrupt hegemonies and to operationalize Decolo you know, decolonial practices. So we shouldn't limit history's influence. Because when we limit history's influence, we are denying its power. Yet it has the power to influence us in our future directions, current practice and future directions. History has taught us many important lessons. And I just want to move a bit to my discipline in the languages. One lesson is that language can be used and has been used as a tool of exclusion. Consequently, language pedagogy is one area that wields power to oppress, exclude, or to empower. Therefore, language pedagogy 
should disrupt hegemonies, just like any, any pedagogy in any discipline. I'll give an example of what is happening in the language uh, department, English language specifically. While apartheid education reinforced inequalities, education at Forte obviously ought to be predominantly focused on disrupting that oppressive and, uh, and, uh, and continuously, you know, how do you explain it? The, the discourse back then was that uh, there was that separatist trend of separating, you know, students according to color, as we noticed from the explanations that Prof was giving us. But we are saying now, how do we use language, which was then used as a tool of exclusion, as a tool of inclusion? Because we get to a point where we see that access to a university campus does not equal access to knowledge. Those are two different things. A student can be on campus, but the language uh, in which learning material is packaged can actually cause that student not to be able to access that knowledge. It can render that knowledge inaccessible. So this raises questions of social injustice and epistemic violence. And in the Department of English, we are using methodologies like uh, like translanguaging, translanguaging which allows the incorporation of indigenous languages in the teaching of the English language. So while you can have students, for instance, foundation students who are trying to bridge the gap in entering university and they are struggling with the English language, translanguaging then allows them to actually understand the concepts that are in the English course while they are using their various indigenous languages. So this is just one methodology which uh, breaks the conventions that we have known from apartheid and colonialism. And we find that uh, teaching language in full awareness of the hegemonies that existed in the past actually helps a South African student to get to a point where they have self-determination and identity affirmation, something which was not present during the apartheid and colonial period. So translanguaging pedagogy, as I was saying, is one teaching approach with uh, decolonial implications. And this is just one example that I'm giving, but we can actually look at our disciplines, the different disciplines, and say what teaching methodologies can actually assist us in our bid to decolonize, to transform, and to renew. Uh, as I am nearing the end, I just want to give some few questions that I listed to say, these are some of the questions that we can ask ourselves as we look at our rich history, as we reflect on Noni Jabavu's uh, life and work. How are we interpreting the implications of Forte's history on pedagogy? How does Forte, as an institution of higher learning, with a robust history, operationalize a pedagogy of transformation, a pedagogy of renewal, with latitude to transform even society? What practical, discursive strategies are we employing as a university? in faculties, in departments, as researchers, as, le as lecturers, on our research agendas, our teaching agendas. What strategies are we employing to address the access paradox, where we are saying just having a student on campus does not mean they can access the knowledge. What are we doing to assist students to access the knowledge itself, not just campuses, not just Blackboard, not just being in the Black Auditorium, and how are we questioning anglo-normative uh, uh, ways of, of knowing and ways of teaching, ways of doing things? Are we doing something to counter anglo-normativity? What is our style? Given the ever-present pressures of modernity, 
that manifest through globalization and global ratings, how do we delineate and maintain a distinctively Fortarian approach, African approach in the teaching of humanities, something that is unique to us and which values, as my colleague has already stated, are we foregrounding in this regard? So we have a lot of potential and uh, when you listen to the history as Prof was, was laying it out and the challenges and, uh, and everything that has happened in between, you see that uh, Forte has got, push, has got potentialities to, to create decolonial cultures through pedagogy. It has potentialities to, 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 to even intellectualize indigenous languages. It has potentialities to overturn the dominant paradigm of uh, say, having English as the standard language in which knowledge is packaged, there's a lot of possibility around that area. There's potential to move away from a monolingual scripted curricula so that we get to a point where we can create uh, indigenized approaches where we can actually advance uniquely southern epist epistemologies where we have got ownership rather than continuing to be teaching and researching from perspectives that we do not own, perspectives whose origins we are unsure of, or perspectives that belong elsewhere. So in conclusion, yes, universities are sites of contestation. There is a legitimate struggle for not only knowledge acquisition, but identity affirmation, decolonization, transformation. So while we remain mindful of this and faithful to our core mandate of investing purposefully to the production of hierarchies of knowledge, I think we would do well to adopt a decolonial approach in which we do not hop on about the marginalized but rather we teach from an informed position that draws from that knowledge of the marginalized, that contested marginalized background. So our preoccupation in pedagogy ought to be that of making pathways beyond colonialism and apartheid, not to be just preoccupied with talking about it, it happened, what pathways are we making from that in our pedagogy? While history mirrors our struggle, resistance, survival, reclamation, transformation, we need to see how are we using this today in our teaching. This can be done by deliberately interrogating current pedagogical norms, as critical sites of entrenched and fossilized recolonizing and colonizing practices. Acknowledging the limitations of current practices will consequently lead to instituting and engaging in situated pedagogical practices drawn from the lived experiences of the previously marginalized student population. And while COVID-19 continues to threaten the university's regeneration projects and renewal and all that, the promise of a revitalized university and working hard each day in our teaching, in learning practices will keep the university on track as we progress into the decade of renewal. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Dr. Ulrich. Um, as we move towards closing, and I'll turn it, the, 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 the gathering over to Dr. Farim for a, for a word of closure and probably to thank the various parties here. Um, I think we, let's try and do one short round of questions, just about three questions to either Professor Watschella Dr. Ulrich or Dr. Zoll, and for the benefit of those who are, who are not in the audience today, who are watching on the, on the machine, if you 
pose a question, could you please give your name also? Let's take three questions or comments. Thank you very much, Dean. My name is Lehlohonolo Bukulani. Um, in the theology and religion department. I, I wish to thank uh, Professor Wachela for the uh, presentation. Um, as I was listening, obviously my interest would be in everything, but in particular theology and religion. I, I wondered whether he wants to comment on the uh, Federal Theological Seminary uh, history from Forte and its expulsion from Forte. Thank, thank you. Th thank you, Reverend. Um, let's 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 take two more questions and then and then we can we can have them have them ad addressed all in one go. Um, uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Chairperson. Um, as a historian... Could you identify yourself, please, okay. Dr. Kompi? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Buti Kompi from the History Department. Um, uh, as a historian, I want to um, ask uh, Prof um, you know, a question, but uh, especially because he made two crucial and painful reality comments about our department. Uh, firstly, you talked about the, the fact that we are short-staffed, and, and unfortunately, uh, that is still prevailing. It is a culture that we wish it will, it, it will end. And secondly, you made another you know, painful um, point about us as being some sort of a, a teaching department, and less of a of a research department, and, and I agree, since my arrival here in 2019, it has been very difficult to publish um, because of the fact that we are short-staffed. Mm. But we intend, moving forward, to improve that. And I'm very happy because we are collaborating, we started collaborating already with NAEX. Mm. He has been involved also with our teaching of our honors. Mm. But we want to change that. We, we no longer want to be seen as a teaching department, but as a balanced department. How can you advise us as a way to start the process of moving forward, to move from being a teaching department to a more balanced department, especially in as far as research is concerned? While we maintain quality teaching and you know, teach content that is relevant and topical to the world out there, a developing world, and you talked about a, 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 an elephant in the room uh, now today about the uh, industrial revolution. How, how can we make us as a department uh, more relevant in that regard? And, and, and lastly, as a historian involved at NAHEX, how can how can you help us? We, we, we have students, you already know that we sent our students uh, to NAHEX, especially those doing uh, liberation history uh, module. But my dream is to see history department collaborating more with NAHEX, or even coming together and working as one. Maybe you can even change the department to include uh, NAHEX. So, and, and in that way, I believe that you will come back home. <laughs> okay, um, is there a third question? Let's just see if one came through from one of our online, have any of our online guests um, posed a question? No. Okay, um, <laughs> Professor Njotini, would you, would, We'd be honoured for you to have a. You, you, you're one of us today, but we'd love to have you pose a, a question or a comment. No, thank you. My, mine will be very quick. Um, um, I think. Uh, let me thank Prof for, for that wonderful uh, uh, presentation. I think uh, I'm learning a lot about the history of the university. But but I think uh, uh, what we know about history is that um, 
it has a way of repeating itself. I think uh, each and every one of us um, uh, 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 want not to be, you know, found, you know, to have uh, 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 repeated history. We know what, what Einstein talks about, the notion of repeating uh, the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to, well, well, well we know um, also that uh, the university has made things easier for us to say uh, we are in a new decade, a decade of renewal. So that's our thinking, that's part of our DNA, knowing, of course, um, where we come from as a university. I'm not going to, 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 to repeat uh, uh, what Prof. Is clearly enunciated. Uh, I just want to find out what lessons um, from some of the incidents relating to Estwalandwe, um, uh, we can draw, you know, as we try as far as we can to, to, to capture this new decade, not, not just capture it, it, capture it in an assiduous manner to ensure that uh, we, we, we use our, uh, our physical and intellectual energies you know, towards its uh, realization. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't, we didn't identify the, the, the person who posed the last question. That's Professor Ingettini, the Dean of Law, for those of you who are not, not in the audience today. And there's one last question, I believe. Um, so now, <coughs> Thank you. Sorry, I, I, I think that actually was the last question allowed, but I was just sneaking Do, in here. Um, please identify um, yourself, Dr. My, my name is uh, Christopher Alsobrook. I'm the head of the Center for Leadership Ethics in Africa. Well, it's obviously in Africa, but um, it's here at Fort Hare. <laughs> um, so I just want, I, this is, I had lots of questions. There's so much to talk please about. Please, one, please. What stands out as unique because of our history in teaching, vision, and research for you, uh, Prof. Taylor? Um, could we, in, in the response to that, could we make it a three-part question to have our two respondents give their, their, their input also? Um, Professor Wachella, could I, could I give over to you? And once, once the three of you had answered these questions, um, if, if I could hand over then, I'm going to sit down now. If I could hand over to Dr. Fareem, and afterwards there's food, nourishment um, close by. But um, I'll... I'll stand down now. I've said more than enough, and I have, I'm having a great time listening, but I, I want to listen more. Professor Wachella, I'm was, I was hoping that the questions would be deflected to the respondents. I seem to have magneted so many questions, and in certain cases, some of these actually are not easy. But let me just... I'm going to be very quick in responding because we already are running out of time. Lashonano, uh, if I've got your name correctly, Fetsam has its own very, very critical epoch. We can have a seminar on Fetsam alone, its formation and how it, it, it well, met the fate of being, of course, appropriated. Uh, in, in that uh, period of, of mid-70s. Um, you, you probably would have seen we, in fact, under, under the request by the Vice Chancellor, um, the, when we were memorializing the late Archbishop Tutu, uh, there was a little bit of coverage about Fetsam itself because he was based there from actually late 60s up to up to 1970, um, and, uh, and that history, uh, especially the one you're mentioning about the appropriation around about 74, 75, is part of, of, of a major history of this institution and the fate, of course, of, of what eventually happened to Fed Sam. And the, the writings about this, uh, Gobula's book, you probably would have come across, um, uh, I just don't want to overlabor, but I could have mentioned and be stuck on it, uh, and it would be a film on its own. Um, I do appreciate, however, that you've raised it. And then quickly then to Dr. Combi, 
Yes, of course, uh, one do acknowledge that you, you are understaffed, and, and I'm led to believe now you've got very healthy numbers. Uh, you, you've got, I know I used to teach in the history department quite extensively. Uh, there were two of us, <laughs> even then. And the joke, whenever I was going to conferences and uh, other places, if I'm there, I would say to other colleagues, 50% of the history department is away uh, because there were two of us. <laughs> it's always been a pattern. But, I mean, your other question, of course, is very, very intriguing itself. How then do you begin to, to address that? Uh, what sort of scholarship uh, one can generate and uh, what generation of young scholars you can put in the pipeline uh, to keep rolling the, the, the scholarship kind of endeavors. The, the, the trick balance here, of course, you need to balance between your undergraduate and, and your postgraduate students. Uh, uh, there's always a major challenge in the sense that your postgraduate students you need to supervise, you need to engage them. I don't like the system where, in fact, I've had so many absent postgraduate students. They're in employment, you see somebody once say, yeah, that is not an ideal. When I was doing an honor student, I keep telling, I wrote 38 essays a year, and I was presenting seminars almost every week. Those are the things we want. And, you get those younger scholars and then they get into, in this current world, webinars and uh, all these seminars, then you are actually infatuating that kind of space and you get to debate and it comes actually to Dr. Zaw's uh, uh, sort of, uh, uh, I would say, concern about how do you bring these into the methodologies and inculcate a vibrant scholarship. And that's exactly what the history department can, can do. Of course, there has got to be a recruitment of staff. Uh, I'm willing to lift my hand uh, and say I can help, but I've got other responsibilities elsewhere. Uh, <laughs> there I at <have> NAHEX. <laughs> so, so, but uh, that balance, you have got to invest in these postgraduate students, and they will become the future components of, of, of the department going forward. Um, then the dean. Uh, uh, Prof. Njandini, uh, Njandini, is it? Uh, yes, I've got I've, Jordini. Jordini, Jordini, I've got Jordini, I've got you now. Mm. Prof. Jordini, that's a very, very interesting. What lessons? That's the thing about history. <laughs> what lessons can we take? We going forward. The fascinating part here. Again, I'm going to be going to the discussions. Um, uh, one of the key emphasis that came in the, in the discussion part, of course, is how we need to get into these aspects of decoloniality and these aspects of transformation. But the question, you see, where history actually usually brings in, historians, people, tend to say sometimes they're bordering on, on, on very, very conservatism, but not necessarily conservative, is, is um, when you're dealing with aspects of decoloniality, you still have got to unpack this immense body of knowledge that's been generated in processes of conquest, of colonialism itself. There is no way you're going to be able to articulate decoloniality without understanding those aspects, isn't it? And history actually disconstructs this. And of course you can venture as a historian and deal with the history of the present. History is not only the study of the past. I always tell my students, uh, you examine the past in order to make the sense of the present and then you get to articulate on aspects that are confronting the present in posing critical questions going forward. And in this particular case, we have got a classical sort of example of these questions we are posing on this history on how 
their impact on the methodologies we're suggesting to take and implement going forward. More or less the same answer actually can go to Chris uh, because Chris uh, uh, is actually concerned about the research and the scholarship at Fort Hare arising out of this. The, the first thing I could say, categorically, we don't need to operate in silos. <laughs> we, 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 we're speaking most of the time on more common themes. Uh, of course, we can always approach them in different angles. In fact, I'm going to come back to your point too. History, you can say, yes, it repeats itself. But processes sometimes are not normally the same. But it, again, uh, in, in being able to dialogue from various angles and bringing this multidisciplinarity, uh, it gives us options to broaden scholarship and utilize the resource of this bequest, of this heritage, to multiple fronts. So basically, those are the answers I can give to the questions that have been raised. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. I think it was just the one question for, for me. Um, and what makes Fort Hare unique? Um, I think there's many, many aspects. And for me, it's really um, spatial that we have this, this Eastern Cape, which is um, very rural um, and also very traditional and has very different um, political, social, and cultural practices that go with that. Um, so space is very important, and again, obviously, as a historian, um, time. And things, to me, the two important times that are capturing my imagination at present are really this older past, this, this intellectual challenge, this um, emancipatory thought and, and different ways to go about it, both in the past and the present, but how that collides, and I think that came across in your paper, with sort of the homeland history that we've also, this legacy that we also have to deal with, which is also very um, stubborn. So it's the combination of those. And I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Prof, and thank you, colleagues. I just want to respond uh, to a little to a question that was on research, how we can uh, work on our research while we are teaching, while we are delivering quality teaching. Uh, I just want to say something briefly that uh, the way I look at it is that um, what we research on uh, influences our teaching, our teaching influences our research. And I'm thinking, uh, in the League of Collaborations, I don't see anything that stops the history department uh, lecturers collaborating with uh, uh, lecturers from uh, the English department, literature, social work, and so on. So the way I see how we can bridge this gap because of maybe student numbers, because of uh, uh, staffing issues is collaboration. I think collaboration can go a long way. Uh, obviously, we are in luck because uh, the dean has come up with this uh, uh, hub that is going to allow us to be workshopping, to be doing seminars, to be doing writing retreats, and all that. So now it will even in enhance that opportunity for us to meet and collaborate. Because that way, I don't want to say uh, it's half the job done. But it's, uh, it's many minds coming together, uh, you know, going multidisciplinary, and then we've got that uh, interface of, uh, of fields, of disciplines, while looking at the same thing, but from different angles, like what Prof was saying. So I think that might help us in our quest to, to, to publish while we are 
delivering quality in the classroom. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I've been given a very difficult task of closing. And um, it's a difficult task because all the bright ideas have already been discussed. And this comes at a time when um, it's getting dark and cold and everyone is kind of impatient to leave. <laughs> so um, uh, the, the, the dean has basically in his opening address factored in a certain um, vote of thanks, so to speak. Um, so we, we, he, he spoke at some length about the objectives of the lecture series. Uh, historians tend to speak at length. Um, so uh, we've seen that happening here. So um, he, he kind of already thanked the Jababu family um, for accepting uh, that this lecture series be named after them. Um, and I also want to thank the dean for the initiative and his willingness to rope some of us in from the faculty. Uh, this initiative comes at a very tenuous time in the University of Fort Hill when it is embarking on that drive to reimagine and reinvent, or maybe rather reposition itself. And I say reposition because whenever I kind of travel out of the province, whenever I travel out of the country or out of the continent, I, I often come across someone who, um, when I say I'm from the University of Fort Hay, and I, I, the person I'm talking to, if, if they have a fair knowledge of government and politics or culture and society, they would, they would beam with some excitement. And then they would tell me something that kind of happened in the university, like, or someone who was here like half a century ago, you know. So the idea is, part of the idea behind this is how can the faculty and the broader university community tap into that rich historical legacy to enhance our contemporary relevance that, that is today. Um, how do we revolutionize? Uh, perhaps, perhaps my VC wouldn't be very comfortable with that word, but how do we transform um, or reinvent um, political thought to create or foster more desirable and cohesive societies? Um, again, how can the sophistication of academic discourse that we've, we've all been hearing hearing here today, how can that be translated into ameliorating the material conditions of local communities? Um, because research has to be relevant um, at the very least to surrounding communities. And looking at Alice itself, I'm not so sure that uh, Fort Hare's existence here since 1916 um, has been having a tremendous impact on its local communities. So, um, the idea behind this is how can we tap into this thought-provoking series to ensure that the university and the faculty specifically repositions itself at the center of critical thinking, um, a center of reflection, but also a center for action. Um, my, my PhD supervisor used to always tell me about communities of practice, so we shouldn't al always just talk but we should ensure that that discourse translates into um, ameliorating the, 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 the lives of, of everyday communities around Alice. Um, so I want to thank you all for coming. Um, I know there's been so much to take in. I want to thank um, Prof. Rochella for accepting to, to, to present, to deliver this inaugural lecture. I want to thank um, Dr. Zhu and Ulrich for Willing, their willingness to be respondent to this. I want to thank especially our VC, who is, who is taking um, time. A lot is happening around the university, who is taking um, um, time out of his obviously very tight schedule to be here. And I want to thank you all for attending this, um, this, this inaugural lecture. Uh, we look forward to a more engaging um, session as far as upcoming lecture series are concerned. And I wish you all a safe trip back to your respective destinations. Stay safe and bye-bye. Thank you.